This podcast is sponsored by Hegarty. The Hegarty curricula has 35 weeks of phonological and phonemic awareness lesson plans aligned to the science of reading. Systematic daily lessons require minimal teacher prep time and take just 10 to 12 minutes to complete. The Hegarty curricula is available in both English and Spanish, and it's being used by thousands of school districts across the U.S., Canada, and Australia. Learn more about the curricula, our intervention book, and decodable readers at hegarty.org. That's H-E-G-G-E-R-T-Y dot org. Greetings, everyone. I'm Laura Stewart from the Reading League. Welcome to Teaching, Reading, and Learning, the TRL podcast, where we elevate important conversations in the educational community in order to inform, inspire, and celebrate contributions to teaching and learning. When we think of people who have made significant contributions to teaching and learning, and specifically to our understanding of how children learn to read, Dr. Linnea Airy is at the top of the list, so I feel really privileged to be speaking to Dr. Airy today. So I'd like to share her biography as a way to introduce Linnea Airy. Linnea Airy is an American psychologist, currently Distinguished Professor Emerita of Educational Psychology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Dr. Airy received her BS in Psychology at the University of Washington in Seattle and her MA in Psychology at San Francisco University. She received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Prior to joining the faculty of the Graduate Center as a distinguished professor in 1991, Linnea was a professor at the University of California, Davis. Linnea has served on editorial boards of nine scientific journals. She has published over 100 research papers, and she has edited two books. Her studies have contributed to our understanding of psychological processes and the sources of difficult, difficulty in learning to read and spell. She has received awards for distinguished research from the Society for the Scientific Study of Reading, American Educational Research Association, International Reading Association, and the National Reading Conference. She is a member of the Reading Hall of Fame and past president of the Society for Scientific Study of Reading. She was a member of the National Reading Panel when it was established by the U.S. Congress to evaluate evidence indicating effective methods of teaching reading. And on this panel, she she chaired the committee that reviewed research on phonemic awareness instruction and systematic phonics instruction. And we'll be talking a lot about that today. Although Dr. Airy has recently received faculty emeritus status, she continues to advise students and offer her expertise on literacy development and reading instruction. Recent publications have examined ways in which children and young adults learn orthographic mapping and spelling. I am delighted today to welcome Dr. Linnea Airy to the podcast. Welcome, Dr. Airy, and thank you so much for being with us today. I know our listeners are really excited to hear from you, so I would just like to jump right in if that's okay with you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's our pleasure and our privilege, truly. So I thought we'd start by just talk, kind of talking about your origins, because I know our listeners are, are interested to know, um, where did you grow up and what inspired you to go into psychology and teaching? Um. <clears throat> Well, I grew up in uh, Seattle, Washington, um, and uh, attended uh, the University of Washington um, uh, as an undergraduate. Um, And uh, I became especially interested in psychology because uh, it allows one to study cause-effect relations uh, in terms of human behavior. to design experiments that allow you to identify cause effect relations and rule out alternative explanations. At the University of Washington, I was a research assistant for um, Donald Bayer, who was a, a, 
a Skinnerian, and I worked in a, a, a nursery school. Uh, it was a research study where I followed a child who was uh, aggressive. He would hit other children and take their toys away. And the purpose of the experiment was to see whether we could reduce the incidence of aggressive behavior um, in two ways. We would, uh, I would signal the teachers to ignore him when he had just committed one of these aggressive acts. And then uh, I would signal when the coast was clear, when he hadn't been aggressive and they would give him attention. So that introduced me to um, uh, work as a researcher. Uh, unfortunately, the child broke his arm. So <laughs> he left the preschool before the study was finished. But uh, the experience uh, got me interested in research. Um, also, I, uh, I became interested in children's uh, thinking uh, through the readings of Piaget. And uh, uh, I remember one incident where uh, I would, he talked about young children attributing uh, feelings and thoughts to inanimate objects. And so he would question children about this. Um, uh, well, one day I was visiting some friends uh, and there were several children playing in the yard. And so I thought, oh, this is an opportunity to uh, investigate children's thinking. You know, there were preschoolers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I uh, asked them, I said, you know, here's a rock. Do you think it has feelings? Do you think if I hit it, it'll feel something? And then I picked some other objects, the same kind of questioning. And then one kid looked up at me and he says, What's the matter, lady? Don't you know anything? <laughs> because because you were asking him all these questions. Silly question. He's like, lady. Yeah. <laughs> he said, this is obvious. They, I mean, that's what he was meaning, that it was obvious they don't have feelings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, I love it. So that was another um, incident that... Uh, showed my interest in, in doing research. Um, and then uh, I went to, we moved from Seattle to San Francisco when I was married. And so I went to um, San Francisco State University and uh, enrolled in their master's program in psychology. Uh, and there I designed a study with rats. Um, it was an experiment. Um, as I recall, it didn't work out so well. But anyway, I tried. <laughs> um, and then <clears throat> uh, being in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, I looked into um, graduate work at the University of California, Berkeley. And um, uh, I was offered a, a fellowship to work with uh, Robert Gagne and uh, some of the other faculty at UC Berkeley. So I went to, that's where I went to graduate school. And I, there I majored in educational psychology um, to focus on children's learning. Um, and at the time, I uh, happened to be there when psycholinguistics was getting off the ground. And Susan Irvin Tripp and Dan Slobin uh, had a very active research program where they brought uh, researchers in from all parts of the world to study uh, child language development in different languages. And so they would come to Berkeley and collaborate, and then they would go off to do their field work. Um, also, Noam Chomsky uh, visited the campus and um, gave lectures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so Linnea, um, so at this point, you were, you were heavily into research. Right. The, um, it was a PhD program. And so I, um, I worked with uh, Bill Rohr on, as a research assistant on his studies. Um, and uh, he was interested in applying psycholinguistics to the study of children's memory. Um, and so uh, he would 
give children a, a memory task where they would remember pairs of words like um, dog and table. And so in one condition, children would hear the dog and the table. In another condition, they would hear the dog sits on the table. And, and what he found in several studies was that when you impose syntactic structure, when you impose a sentence structure uh, on those two nouns, that children's memory improves for the nouns. Um, so it's like syntactic structure acts as a glue to secure the, those word pairs in memory. Um, and so I uh, did some research in a similar vein. Um, I worked on his studies and then I designed a study that uh, I published. So um, in addition to focusing on psycholinguistics and children's memory, um, I also learned a lot about statistics and how you analyze data. Um, part of my background um, to get a PhD. Right, right. This sounds like a really uh, fruitful time for you in terms of your research. Yeah, it was uh, very inspirational and it <laughs> led me to continue doing that for the rest of my years. <laughs> so then how did you uh, move from this, um, you know, the study of the um, linguistics to reading? What made, what made you kind of move into that realm? Well, um, in graduate school, the, uh, the focus on psycholinguistics was on young children's language development before they entered school, pretty much. Um, and in fact, one psycholinguist joked that people avoided studying reading uh, because people read too quickly to be explained by the current theories about language uh, processing. Noam, Ch Noam Chomsky's theory of transformational grammar said that you had to chunk through all these layers to get to the meaning and how people could read so quickly <laughs> defied the, that explanation. So anyway, I didn't get interested in reading until I joined the faculty at the University of California, Davis. Um, and uh, there was some pressure, I shouldn't say pressure, but when you become an assistant professor, uh, you need to start publishing in order to retain your uh, position on the faculty. And uh, so uh, I thought about ways that I could apply my psycholinguistic background in a way that would be more relevant for education. And, uh, so I got interested in reading, and um, the first study I did uh, was in, involved uh, intonation patterns. I reasoned that uh, text lacks uh, stress and pitch cues when uh, people are speaking, reading sentences, and perhaps building that information into the text uh, would improve children's reading um, uh, because they would, it would point out the important words and unimportant words and uh, tell them about stress and pitch. So um, I was able to um, create texts that displayed intonation patterns by uh, making words varying the size of words so that the uh, stressed words were printed in the biggest size and the, there were three different sizes, stressed, medium stress, and unstressed words. And so we created these texts of um, stories where we varied the print size. And then our, in our control conditions, we either varied the word size randomly or we just uh, had them read standard text. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we did a, a, a study where we measured children's accuracy and speed to read these texts. And we found that uh, third graders were able to read the text faster, the intoned text faster than the other two forms of text. And this was a significant difference. So um, I got a grant to pursue these findings. And for uh, a couple of years, we, 
tried to replicate uh, the findings and we were unsuccessful. Uh, now, in the first study, the effect was on children's reading speed. So in the subsequent studies, we, we realized that speed was being impaired because children were, were having difficulty reading some of the words in the text. And so they would, they would slow down and try to decode the words and that would interfere with our speed measure. So uh, we said, well, wait a minute, intonation doesn't seem to be as important as word reading processes. <laughs> so maybe we better switch our focus to uh, how children read words. Um, and so then that started me, that shifted the focus of my research. Um, and then I had, around that time, uh, as I said, I didn't take any courses in reading uh, at UC Berkeley. So I didn't, I had to, I was learning on my own. I was reading studies um, and uh, I had an opportunity to uh, participate in a, a, an institute at the University of Del Delaware sponsored by SRCD, the Society for Research and Child Development. Mm -hmm. And um, this the focus was on language and literacy, language and reading. Um, and there I applied and I was accepted. So I spent a month at the University of Delaware. Uh, there were about 29 other quote student participants. Most of these people were at the end of their PhD work or they were recent um, assistant professors. Uh, they just joined faculty. Um, and over the course of the month, many researchers came and spent two to three days with us talking about their research. Um, uh, examples are Jean Chal, Joanna Williams, Bob Kelty, Dick Vineski, Carol Chomsky. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Liverman and Shankweiler, John Guthrie. And, and but the one that I was most interested in was Ken Goodman, because he had proposed a psycholinguistic guessing game. Right, right. And having this background in psycholinguistics, I thought, ah, you know, this this should be uh, especially informative. Um, so uh, uh, at the Institute, um, he was very uh, congenial and explained his research to us and uh, played tapes on children's miscues. And um, so at the end of the Institute, all of the participants wrote papers um, on some aspect of uh, the presentations at the Institute, something they were interested in. So I wrote a paper on um, psycholinguistics and word reading. And um, mm -hmm. well, let me just back up and say, uh, Ken Goodman's uh, theory of reading involved um, children learning to gain meaning, meaning from print. And children become good readers by improving their ability to predict words in text by attending to syntactic, semantic, and graphic cues. Um, uh, but they don't improve in their reading by precisely learning to decode words. Um, this only teaches them to bark at print and it impedes their access of meaning in words. Um, he viewed reading as a process of sampling all these cues um, and syntactic and semantic cues mm -hmm. derived from the context were more important than graphic cues. Um, and he drew his evidence from uh, the analysis of readers' oral reading errors, which he called miscues. Um, and he observed that the majority of these errors preserve syntactic and semantic information. Um, fewer errors reflected the use of graphic or phonological cues. Um, and so he interpreted his findings to support his theory and to explain how all words are read in text by sampling cues to guess words. Um, 
And having my background in psycholinguistics, I was certainly sympathetic to the idea that readers hold uh, syntactic and semantic ex ex expectations um, about upcoming words in the text. Um, however, I wasn't convinced that that's how readers read most of the words in text. Um, uh, readers, uh, the point is that readers read many more words correctly than incorrectly in a text uh, in order to comprehend the text. Uh, anything below 90% accuracy is considered a frust frustration level. So relatively few words are uh, count as miscues. Um, uh, and if cue sampling and guessing were the way that children read, you'd see many more errors occurring. Um, so I uh, said, I thought to myself, well, there, there's a different process uh, that explains how words are read in text. And this led me to um, propose that words are read from memory by sight, uh, not by guessing, that words are stored in memory and then readers access, access those words in memory to read them automatically. Uh, and so I wrote a paper that uh, elaborated Goodman's uh, theory to include this word recognition mechanism. Um, and uh, I sent a copy of the paper to Goodman and he returned it to me with notes in the margins. Uh, most of those notes said, just stated no, maybe two or three times on a page. And then at the end he wrote, reading is not a process of recognizing reading words. So, so that began my uh, research on word reading and how children are able to move into reading and read words accurately and automatically from memory. Interesting. Interesting. And that's where, I mean, this whole psycholinguistic guessing game, that was really, you know, the start of the ascendancy of the whole language movement. Exactly. Right. You were kind of pushing back against Ken Goodman's theory. Oh, absolutely. At this, at, during this time when that was just gaining traction and a foothold. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, uh, a few years later, I published, um, or I, I should say, I we conducted a study um, uh, that involved two treatment conditions. Uh, in one case, children read words in the context, in sentence context. In the other condition, they read words in isolation on flashcards. And then we assessed how much they remembered about the spellings, pronunciations, meanings of those words. Um, and we found that if children read the words on flashcards, these were kindergarten, first grader, uh, these are first graders, right? Um, and if they read the words on flashcards, they remembered more about the spellings of the words and they could read the words uh, more quickly. However, if they read the words in context, uh, in sentences, then they remembered more about the meanings of the words. And so the, what we were trying to show is that um, there are various identities of words that get stored in memory and your, the experiences that children have reading those words influences what gets stored in memory uh, during the sight word reading process. Um, so we submitted the paper to Reading Research Quarterly uh, for publications, and we were shocked at the reviews that we got back. Um, I can read you some of them. A very slight study, not a very interesting or important topic, full of sentences which need to be rewritten to give them some sparkle. A worthless study which adds to the abundant confusion about learning words. This study signifies nothing but adds sheer weight to the unwarranted focus on words. Really, when will we get to real issues? When will we try to look at kids reading real language? And when will we lift our eyes from the word to meaning? Ah. Wow. And so anyway, the editors rejected the paper and uh, 
submitted it to Child Development, and uh, which is a, a respected journal, and they published it. And then uh, we did another very similar study, and uh, we submitted that one to Reading Research Quarterly. And at this point, the um, editors had changed, and they accepted the paper. And in fact, the uh, paper was given an award uh, for publications in that year, the issues during that year of reading research quarterly. Interesting. So, so, I mean, the point is that there's a lot of resistance to a study of words. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think it's reflected in Goodman's um, views. So do you think that that first round with those kind of brutal reviews was that, do you, do you attribute that to the environment at the time? Right, right. Yeah, and then how many years later was the second um, submission to Reading Research Quarterly? Uh, it, was, it was just a couple years later, but the critical thing was that the editors had changed and, and they, David Pearson was one of the editors and they were much more sympathetic to uh, studies to try to understand how children read words because words are the core of text. You know, if you can't read the words, you're not going to comprehend the text. So, <laughs> well, but you know, and and you know, I think I can speak for all of us when I say thank you for persisting in this line of inquiry because I think your work has really, you know, helped us focus on that whole concept that we have to get the words off the page. Um, but I still think there's a lot of misunderstandings out there, especially around this idea of sight recognition. Um, so can you can you talk to us a little bit more about sight word reading and the whole idea of unitizing? Um, because I think there are still some schools of thought that children just memorize whole words or look at visual shapes of words. So perhaps you can speak to that. Yeah, well, you know, um... During the days uh, when uh, children, whole word instruction was popular, children were just shown words on flashcards and expected to, to remember them. And this was even before children knew alphabet letters and um, uh, performance was really limited. Um, in fact, in our work, if children don't know letters, you know, then they try to use these visual cues, but they their memory for words is very poor. You just can't remember words based on uh, shapes or chains of letters. There just isn't enough information there to distinguish among all the thousands of words that you can read from memory. So uh, that can't be the explanation. Um, so. Uh, our theory uh, the, the, the theory that I proposed um, to explain sight word reading involved uh, forming connections between uh, let, graphemes in the spellings of words and phonemes in their pronunciations. And uh, knowledge of the graphene phoneme writing system provides the glue that allows children to form connections between letters in the spellings and sounds in the pronunciation. So once you've got that glue, the spellings can be uh, secured, bonded to pronunciations and stored in memory. And so subsequently, when you see those words, uh, you can read them from memory by sight. You don't have to decode them. You don't have to predict them because the word is stored there in memory. Um, and uh, the or I think I mentioned early, the, earlier that the origin of this idea of connectionism really arose from my work with Bill Rohr, where he was showing that imposing sentence structure on specific word pairs boosted memory for the word pairs. And so sentence structure serves as glue that helps to get that, that specific information in memory. And so uh, knowledge of the graphene phoneme system acts very similarly to secure specific spellings of specific words 
to their pronunciations and memory. Um, for example, if you if you're introduced to somebody who has an unusual name, uh, you may ask, how is it spelled? And then once you hear the letters in the spelling, that clarifies sounds in the pronunciation and helps you remember that, that person's name. So it's a very powerful mnemonic system, knowing grapheme phoneme relations that serves uh, to get words specific words in memory for sight word reading. So I want to I want to elevate some of these things that you've said, because I think it's really important for our listeners. Um, you know, interestingly enough, you talk about the glue um, is that that those connections between graphemes and phonemes. And that is actually the system that Ken Goodman de-emphasized and said it was the least important. Right. right. Yeah. So at that point, you were taking some of these studies that you done in the psycholinguistics field and applying it to reading to help us understand that mnemonic system. Right, right. Yeah, because, because it, it just, stand, yeah, it stands to reason that you can't memorize your way to reading. You just can't visually memorize your way to reading. Well, in a sense, you are. There Certainly visual memory is involved because spellings are visual forms, but you have to analyze the spellings in terms of the graphemes as they connect to phonemes in the words. It's a special kind of memory. And there's some evidence that it's different from uh, non-alphabetic memory, like memory for faces or memory for other visual, uh, form, visual things. You know, it's a special form that's uh, grounded in the analysis of grapheme phoneme relations. And of course, once children uh, build a lexicon of sight words in memory that's fully analyzed with these grapheme phoneme relations, they learn larger chunks in words and parts of words. And so um, they can use uh, spellings of syllables, spellings of morphemes, multi-letter units, um, and they can recognize those in the spellings of words and connect those to pronunciations in the words and then get multisyllabic words in memory uh, that way. Mm -hmm. So it, their knowledge of the writing system begins with grapheme phonemes and that expands to larger uh, spelling units. Uh, mm -hmm. So so when you first when you were first doing this this research and, and throwing this out there in the world, phonemes weren't really um, things that we were paying a lot of attention to. Now, Liverman and Shankweiler in the U.S. were really um, the first to draw attention to phonemes to show that they're uh, strongly related to how well children learn to read um, and uh, to identify various ways of assessing uh, children's phonemic awareness. So I know one, one question a lot of people have is um, when we think about the, the importance of these graphophonic relationships and spelling patterns, um, a lot of people have questions around repetition and how important repetition is to secure uh, those words in our sight word recognition. Can you speak to that? Um, that's one of the powerful uh, effects of having this mnemonic system, the graphene phoneme relations, because it's so powerful, you don't need very many exposures to get words into memory. Now, notice the child has to know those graphene phoneme relations. It has to be uh, has to have mastered them and be able to apply them uh, in reading words. So when he reads the spelling of a word. Th those connections have to be activated uh, to, to connect the spelling to the pronunciation. So you need to have that knowledge base. But once you have that, then it doesn't take very many exposures. David Scher uh, did some uh, research showing that maybe three or four exposures to a word as children are reading text um, is sufficient to get uh, information about the spelling of the word in memory. Great. So, right. So that's that's that whole self-teaching mechanism. Right. He, he proposed um, 
that children, uh, when they read text and read unfamiliar words in text, that they can apply their decoding skill to uh, pronounce the word and then uh, get it in, into memory. He showed that there was memory for those words, unfamiliar words, uh, when children decoded them. Um, interest, you know, it's interesting. Um, David Scher <clears throat> uh, learned, he, he did his graduate work and early research in Australia. And then um, at one, he's uh, Jewish uh, and he always wanted to move to Israel. So he picked up his, <laughs> his work and he, um, in his travels, it, during his travel to Israel, he passed through the United States and he made um, appointments with several researchers along the way um, to talk to them about their reading research and their views about reading. And I was um, in the Bay Area at the time. And so he came uh, to my house and uh, we chatted um, about reading. Uh, so it was interesting. And then he went to Israel and he didn't even know Hebrew. And uh, so he taught himself Hebrew and uh, began teaching courses in Hebrew at uh, Haifa University. Anyway, that's a side. Oh, story, but I, yeah. it was, it's interesting. I think that our work in the U.S. influenced uh, his thinking about self-teaching and um, how children read words. Um, you know, you mentioned my work, but it's important to recognize that this was done in the context of lots of other people. And so around the time I was doing this research, uh, there were other psychologists who also uh, became interested in reading. And uh, for example, uh, Rich West was one of the participants at the Institute. And he was a good friend of Keith Stanovich. Uh, and they were both graduate students at the University of Michigan. So he went back to Michigan and they were very concerned about Goodman's claim that good readers read words by predicting, by guessing them from context. So they did a number of studies to show that that's how poor readers read. They depend on context to read words, that good readers process words fully um, to, to read them, that they don't. Certainly text has an influence on reading words, but if you're a good reader, you don't need that context to recognize the words because you've got it stored in memory. Yeah. yeah. Or you can decode it um, if it's an unfamiliar word. Right. You know, I, I think that's so important because I do, there are practices that are still in existence that are really based on this idea that readers depend on context. And there are practices in classrooms where teachers tell children, you know, skip the word. Um, what do you think makes sense? Uh, you know, looking at context and pictures as opposed to looking at the words. And I think that, you know, one of the one of the insights I think is that has come through the science of reading as a movement, I would say, is this idea that that is what poor readers depend on as opposed to having this mechanism that allows them to store these words um, for sight word recognition. The evidence shows that poor readers lacks, lack decoding skills. Their spelling skill is very limited. And so they haven't uh, acquired mastery of this writing system, the graphophonemic system, and how to apply it in uh, decoding words and reading them to get sight words in memory. So their sight word uh, lexicon is limited. It appears that maybe it only includes some of the letters in words. And so guessing becomes much more important uh, in their reading. Yeah, exactly. So evidence shows poor readers lack the decoding skills. Um, so one thing I wanted to say is I would love to have been a fly on the wall for this conversation when David Scher stopped by and you guys were able to talk. I bet that was just fascinating. <laughs> um, so I wanted, I wanted to ask you about um, 
you know, if we understand the importance of sight word learning and the and this process of acquiring those sight words, I'd like to to talk a little, have you talk about the phases, because I think this, this, these phases are the work that most teachers are familiar with, I think. So can you just really? clarify, oh, <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> clarify phases versus stages and maybe just kind of give us a brief explanation of that um, so that we can uh, acknowledge that important piece that you've, um, that you've contributed to our understanding. Um. <clears throat> okay, um, well, I proposed a series of uh, sequence of four phases to describe uh, the emergence of sight word reading skill in beginning readers. Um, um, these phases, well, maybe first I should describe what the phases involve and then explain the difference between phases and stages, but um, the phases are labeled to reflect the alphabetic knowledge that predominates in the connections that students form to store words in memory. Um, and at the, there are four phases. At the pre-alphabetic phase, children use visual non-alphabetic connections. Um, for example, if they are observed to read McDonald's, uh, they're looking at the golden arches. They're not looking at the arches forming an M. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And <clears throat> at the partial alphabetic stage, children use some letter sound connections. They have learned uh, many letters of the alphabet and they can use those uh, to analyze uh, graphing phoneme relations in words, but their knowledge is partial uh, so they may remember beginning and ending uh, graphing phoneme relations in words, but not the middle. They may lack sufficient vowel knowledge um, about how vowels spell sounds in words. Um, uh, and you can see this in their invented spellings where you ask them to write the sounds in words and they'll only be able to write some of the sounds. And they lack decoding skill. Um, so, but they can still use what they know to remember uh, words for sight word reading by memory for partial letter sound connections. And then at the full alphabetic phase, children have much better knowledge, uh, more complete knowledge about graphene phoneme relations. Um, uh, they can decode, they can use that knowledge to decode words and they can fully analyze uh, the graphene pointing relations in words to store uh, spellings and memory bonded to their pronunciations and, and meanings. Um, uh, and then the final phase is a consolidated alphabetic phase where <clears throat> children have acquired uh, knowledge of uh, wor many words. They, they can read many words um, and these words have the spellings of these words have become unitized. So they function as a single unit. Um, and also uh, morphemes like ing, ed uh, endings have been learned as units. And so at the consolidated phase, children can use these larger spelling units um, to read multisyllabic words. Um, so those are the four phases. Now, the difference between phases and stages is that um, information used uh, at one or another stage overlaps um, with inference. So at the, uh, at the partial phase, well, let's say at the full phase, children may still be using partial connections uh, to read some words, but the predominant uh, type of knowledge used at the full phase is graphene phoneme relations. Um, that, whereas with a stage theory, um, you, a stage theory proposes that you use uh, exclusively one type at each of the different stages and that when you switch to a new stage, you're using new information at that stage and not 
information at an earlier stage, whereas a phase theory is more uh, flexible. I guess it, it mm -hmm. you could use information at multiple stages to read to remember how to read words, but one type predominates. Does that make sense? It sure does. Yeah. I mean, basically what you're saying, I mean, tell me if this is, you know, um, another way to think about it is that the knowledge used or the information used in each of those phases doesn't go away as you move into another phase. You're, you're constantly, you know, using that knowledge or information based on the task at hand. Right. The words that you the that words you're that you're encountering. Yeah. You may encounter words uh, that were at the consolidated phase. Certainly, you'll encounter words where you don't recognize any larger uh, multi multi letter units, and so you use graphing phoneme units. Phoneme graphing, right? Yeah. So there's overlap in the information used across the phases. Right. And so, um, so when we think about um, this, you know, phase. Uh, concept. Do you, are there any new learnings or um, outstanding issues that have impacted this? Would you say in the recent research or in your recent your recent work? There's uh, one study that we've recently that we're in the process of publishing. I should say we've submitted it and then revised it. It was a study done with a Brazilian uh, graduate student. Um, during the course of his graduate work, he came and uh, he spent a year with me and uh, he took my classes and we talked about uh, issues in Brazil. Um, the approach to reading in Brazil has been uh, heavily influenced by uh, Emilia Ferrero and she has adopted a, she views beginning reading as a syllabic process. Um, in spoken Portuguese, syllables are especially important. Um, and so uh, in learning to read, she regards syllables as an important unit of print. Um, and uh, in addition, the uh, sort of a discovery, whole language approach has been uh, part of her influence on schools. And so children in the public schools have not, uh, their reading achievement is uh, disappointing. Anyway, so Hainan Sargiani worked with me and he uh, wanted to conduct a study comparing uh, syllable reading to graphing phoneme reading. And so we designed a study and he carried it out where in one condition, children learn to read syllable. These are CV syllables, which are uh, appear in lots of Brazilian words. Uh, and one group learned to read uh, uh, many syllables by just decoding, by saying the grapheme, phoneme, relations separately and then blending them to read the syllables. And we taught them to criterion in that case, in that condition. In the other condition, children just practiced mm -hmm. reading these CVs, co consonant vowel units as whole syllables. And they went through the whole, the same long sequence of lists of CVs. And we taught them to criterion in both condition. And then we examined uh, children's ability to, to read uh, syllables that hadn't been taught, to learn to read words by sight, to spell words. And we found a huge difference between the two groups, that the syllable group just tried to learn those syllables as units. Uh, when we examined their knowledge about graphene phoneme units, even though these, these syllables had repeated these the same grapheme phoneme uh, units across all the syllables, they couldn't tell you the sounds of the letters. It was very poor. So focusing on a larger unit at the, at the outset of reading uh, did not advance them much in terms of their reading. And we were especially surprised that they didn't analyze those 
crafting phony relations within these very simple units that they learn to read. Um, you know, so this told us that it's especially important for kids to work with the smallest units when they learn to decode uh, mm -hmm. in an alphabetic language, that that is gonna provide the foundation that allows them to move into reading. Right, so, so the, phase, the phases really hold up in an alphabetic system regardless of how transparent the orthography is. Oh, exactly. In fact, phases are does, phases work in a better, in a, maybe better in a transparent orthography where we're talking about using graphene phoneme relations to read and spell words. Well, that's a transparent orthography. English, unfortunately, has some complexities that um, uh, make it a little uh, harder to move into reading. In fact, there's evidence that kids in a transparent orthography learn to read uh, at the end of a year, it takes people, students in English two or three years to learn to read. So English really slows them down. But it's important to note that even though we have irregularities in the spellings of words, that there are still enough graphene phoneme relations within those words to build them into memory, mm -hmm. to, to connect the spelling to the pronunciation. So like in, uh, sword, all but the W maps onto phonemes in the pronunciation. In listen, all but the T maps. So even with irregular words, you, the same connection forming process applies to get those words into memory. Oh, and one other thing, people used to think that sight word reading uh, meant only irregular uh, irregularly spelled words or high frequency words, you had to memorize those not using alphabetic uh, information. And that's not true. All words get learned as sight words. Yes. And I think that's such an important point because I think that has been very misunderstood. As I mentioned before, I think that I, you know, there, there have been many teaching practices around this idea that high frequency words are, or, or irregularly spelled words are somehow not mappable and therefore they're just learned as a as a whole unit almost at a visual level and so making that point that you know even with irregular words we want kids to map the grapheme phonemes and 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 help which will help support this acquisition um, of that word as a sight word yeah and so um Linnea, when is that research going to be available the, the brazilian study that you're oh, in well uh, if anybody wants a copy, I could, uh, you know, I have a, a pre-publication copy. We're just waiting to hear back from the editors uh, about our revisions and whether they're accepted. Um, well, it sounds really important and, and interesting. So thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, I, and I wanted to, I wanted to also, um, I wanted to kind of move into your work um, at the National Reading Panel. You know, you were a panelist um, for the National Reading Panel, and recently you wrote a journal article for our Reading League journal, um, which really summarized the findings of the National Reading Panel. And I just have to say, in our journal, this is one of my favorite articles um, because it was so clear and concise, and you just gave a wonderful perspective on the whole National Reading Re Panel report. And you talked it again. You, you, we talked about it as a game changer. So, can you just talk to why this was a game changer and why the United States was ripe for this report in two thousand? Okay. Um, well, uh, in terms of being a uh, well, let's start with being ripe. Um, uh, the climate in the U.S. at this time really needed something like uh, the, the National Reading Panel Report. Um, there was strong disagreement about the most effective way to teach children to read. Um, it's been referred to as the reading wars. And as I mentioned earlier, I was involved in, in some of that, of, of uh, uh, having a lot of opposition to uh, the use of to systematic phonics instruction, which uh, 
follows from the word reading research that I did. Um, uh, so there was the phonics instruction advocated teaching letter sounds explicitly and systematically, whereas a whole language approach advocated a meaning based and minimized the importance of graphing, phoning, decoding skills to read. Um, so resolving this, the reading wars was one um, reason why such a report uh, was thought to be useful. The second was that there was a neglect of research findings. Um, over the years, uh, the US government had funded uh, high quality research studies on reading acquisition and instruction. Um, and the results improved our knowledge about how children learn to read and then the types of instruction that were effective. But these findings weren't being implemented in schools. Um, rather, approaches that were not supported by the evidence were being used. And it appeared that the loudest voices were influencing instruction more than um, the evidence. So uh, bringing attention, publishing a report that reported on scientific findings of these studies that the government had supported was important. Uh, and then third, um, students were not performing very well on uh, national reading tests. Their performance was below expected levels. Um, and the number of students requiring remedial instruction was rising. Um, so that was a third reason uh, that such a report was believed to uh, hopefully have an impact. Um, and then in terms of being a game changer, um, uh, the panel was appointed by the US Congress, uh, which is uh, certainly a respected body. Um, so it drew national attention uh, from its origin. Um, and the members represented not just scientists, but a broad, uh, spectrum of uh, people involved in reading. There were um, teacher, there were, were teachers, educators, administer, administrators, and uh, a parent um, that formed the panel of 14 people. Um, and our purpose was to review the scientifically based research on effective methods of teaching reading in kindergarten through sixth grade. Um, and then uh, once we provided a report on these findings, then the purpose was to distribute these findings widely. Um, and we reported on, we identified five major topics uh, where reading instruction uh, had to be um, implemented effectively. And these five areas were phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and reading comprehension. Um, in fact, a meta meta a formal statistical meta analysis, uh, two of them were performed: one on phonemic awareness instruction and one on phonics. Um, and then, uh, in terms of having an impact, uh, the report was published in two thousand, and it guided. Uh, reading first uh, legislation, um, $5 billion were uh, appropriated. Uh, and it was part of uh, Bush's No Child Left Behind legislation. Um, also, it drew attention to the importance of basing instruction on scientific findings. Um, and so a lot more attention was paid to programs and whether they're uh, whether the program was based on scientific findings. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in fact, I had uh, I had um, a researcher uh, who had developed a very effective program called Reading Rescue. Um, I met her, and she approached me about doing research on her program because she felt that in order to convince schools to adopt her program, it was a, a similar to reading recovery, only it involved more phonics. And um, uh, 
And so she got her foundation to hire me and uh, some of my colleagues to do a research study on her program uh, because she felt that it was important for uh, obtaining scientific evidence to support her program. And so we went ahead and we did that study and published it. Wonderful. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I love what you said about, you know, loudest voices versus evidence. You know, who was in, who was, this was a, a moment when we could start to really influence reading instruction through evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about um, the studies on phonemic awareness because this, I know you, you headed this subgroup. Am I correct in that? Right, right. Yeah. And I, I, from my understanding is that some of the studies that were reviewed by the National Reading Panel um, included phonological work without letters, phonological work with letters at a later point, um, studies using letters as initial prompts. And I, I just wanted to go back to this. There's a lot of buzz right now about this whole idea of you know, how we approach phonemic awareness. And I wanted to go back to something that you had written in our journal article and just read it for our listeners and then have you comment on it. Phonemic awareness instruction was found to be effective when children were taught to manipulate phonemes and spoken words by pronouncing them separately or by moving tokens to distinguish them. A subgroup of studies examined the contribution of letter knowledge. Results suggested that teaching children to manipulate letters representing phonemes and spoken words was especially effective in teaching phonemic awareness and its transfer to reading and spelling tasks. So it, it seems pretty clear, but I think where the confusion comes um, is people, you know, questioning, do we do oral phonemic awareness tasks or phonemic awareness tasks with tokens, or do we just get right to phonemes and letters, which seems like phonics to me. So maybe you can, can kind of add some clarity to that for us. Well, um, first of all, the studies that we reviewed showed that teaching phonemic awareness, either with letters or without letters, both, for, both approaches were effective in teaching children phonemic awareness uh, and in having an impact on, on reading and spelling. Those effect sizes were significant. So arguing that teaching phonemic awareness without letters uh, isn't, it still is valuable. Okay. And then why would you teach phonemic awareness without letters? Well, what about children who haven't learned letters yet? You can introduce phonemic awareness, uh, especially uh, initial sounds in words. That's pretty easy to strip off of, of words. So you can begin phonemic awareness instruction without letters uh, when children don't know letters. Um, also, uh, we've done some research uh, examining the impact of drawing children's attention to not only sounds in words, which are ephemeral and disappear as soon as they're produced, as soon as they're heard, but uh, amplifying that with uh, monitoring mouth positions and movements that are, are occur as children are pronouncing the separate sounds in words. It makes it much clearer when children can uh, focus on their mouth and when they say at their mouth closes and then opens and then something touches their tongue touches in the, their mouth and so helping children distinguish those sounds uh, with mouth movements uh, can be done uh, as another way without letters to teach phonemic awareness um, and uh, of course the value of teaching with letters is that there's greater transfer. So if you're uh, analyzing uh, sounds and words with letters, then when you have to read, when you come, when it comes to reading words or spelling words, you've already uh, learned those associations that you can use um, for reading or spelling or for learning sight, building sight words in memory. You know, in fact, uh, we've shown that 
in one study, we showed that teaching children uh, phonemic awareness by analyzing their mouth movements and then letters. Uh, so we taught both mouth movements and letters as a way of learning phonemic awareness. And then we examined, and in the, the uh, comparison group, they just learned letters. And then we examined uh, the, the impact of this on sight word learning. And we found that the group that had articulation as well as uh, letters uh, learned to read those words much better than the letter group, um, uh, suggesting that maybe articulation, mouth movements help to secure those letters better in memory for, for reading those words. Um, Wonderful. So the mouth movements through articulation, then letters, has a higher transfer to word reading than just starting with letters. Right, in, in our study. Now, I should point out that, that we taught students to criterion and both groups learned phonemic awareness with letters or in either condition. And typically that's been observed in these studies that um, the same number of trials are required uh, taken by children to learn when they're taught with letters or they're taught with tokens. We did one study where that that's what we found. Um, but if they receive training with letters, then they do better on the post tests, you know, like uh, segmenting uh, new words into their sounds um, or learning uh, to read or spell words. Mm -hmm. so, but it makes sense because those tasks, uh, a reading or a spelling task, require the letters, and you have taught the letters if you use tokens. So, mm -hmm. but there's so so the value of of doing the phonologic tasks with tokens, or that just focus on the articulation, those are valuable before kids know letters. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you for that. I, Cause I think there's been, I think there's been, you know, some, some confusion out there um, around some of the original research. Um, what do you think people sometimes get wrong about the national reading panel report? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't have any, I don't know. That's, that's fine. Um, and I, one thing I would love if you could share with our listeners, um, your story about the chair, Donald Langenberg, and he's a physicist, and what he said during his address to Congress when he presented the report. Yeah, at the, yeah, at the end of uh, the panel service, we went to Washington, D.C. to present our report to Congress, um, and uh, our chair was Dr. Donald Langenberg, who was a physicist, and he was also chancellor of the University of Maryland. Um, now, Dr. Langenberg knew very little about reading instruction when he began his job, but he was committed to leading our charge in identifying the most effective ways to teach students to read. Um, and during our first meeting, uh, Dr. Langenberg was given a booklet written by Louisa Motes. Uh, entitled Teaching Reading is Rocket Science. And he was especially interested in this booklet because his business was rocket science. So two years later, when he addressed Congress in presenting our report, he referred to this booklet and he complained that its title was quite misleading. He said, and I quote, as a physicist chairing this panel for two years and preparing this report, I have come to realize that teaching reading is really much harder than rocket science. <laughs> I just love that. I just love that, especially coming from a physicist. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, well, thank you for your contributions to the National Reading Panel, um, because I do see that as at least in my when I think about my own, you know, development and evolution as a as an educator, that was a watershed moment for me. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, it really was. I mean, I, I came up during the whole language years. I mean, I, you know, I knew so much about Ken Goodman's work and the National Reading Panel was a moment you know, for me. And I think other people, um, perhaps of my era, 
who then looked at that and thought, okay, we are a profession that can now hold ourselves to a standard of research and evidence and how, how actually empowering that can be. You know? That's wonderful. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. Oh, thank you. Um, so how far do you think, when we think about our evolution, our development, how far do you think we have come in our understanding about the process of reading and our understanding about reading instruction since your early work? Oh, I think there's been immense progress. Um, the amount of research since the early days is just urgent. I mean, the number, there have been uh, new journals introduced and many more people doing uh, research on reading and reading instruction um, and more money allocated by the government for uh, reading research. Um, the studies are better designed. Um, more controlled studies to clarify uh, the processes involved in learning to read and uh, effective instruction. Um, brain research has uh, emerged and clarified what's going, what appears to be going on in the brain when beginning readers uh, move into reading and what might be, what processing might not be happening when you have um, this dyslexic or disabled readers uh, before they receive remediation in their reading. And then computer programs have been developed to help children learn to read. Um, yeah. I we've also, one other thing, uh, there's been concern about professional development of teachers and how much they need to know in order to teach reading. And, and so there have been studies that uh, provide evidence regarding that and uh, show the importance of teachers learning more about phonemic awareness and how to break words into their smallest sounds and uh, how to uh, conduct effective instruction. So I think that's an important uh, source of progress too. Yeah, that's... And I, I feel very hopeful um, about this as well. And I know when I share with teachers the, the amount of research and how long this research has been going on and you know multiple fields of study, including the neuroscience, um, people are often surprised by that. So I think just you know elevating that, the sheer amount of research we have to guide our practice. Um, again, I think that's that can be very empowering. What do you what do you think is left to do? I mean, what are the what are the areas in which um, you know we can shift attention now to help us move toward all students reading? Well, that's a big <laughs> question. You know, what? there'd be a, a lot of directions. I I imagine you know depending on who you ask, and so. Uh, I guess I'll just answer by focusing on one concern I have that um, where I'd like to see more research. Um, we did a study a few years ago where we examined the effect of uh, children, the, these are fifth graders, I guess. Um, we had them read text. Um, and the text clarified the meanings of some unfamiliar words. And in one condition, we had children pronounce the words aloud. Um, and in the other condition, they read the words silently. They read the text silently, but these words uh, were um, marked as ones that they should either read aloud or in the silent condition uh, just to uh, note them uh, in the text. And then we examined what they learned about those words and reading them aloud made a difference that uh, the spellings, uh, being able to, to read the words out of, uh, remember how to read the words was better if they had pronounced them aloud. So I become, and that was the only study we did of that sort, um, although in our other studies, children have always said, spoken the words aloud, but I'm concerned about the use of silent reading uh, during the beginning years. Um, our theory suggests that to get sight words in memory, you need to pronounce the words. Uh, 
so that the spellings map onto the pronunciations. And if children are, if beginning readers are reading words silently, I am not so sure that those pronunciations are activated sufficiently so that the spellings become bonded uh, to the pronunciations. Um, you know, I've talked to teachers in kindergarten, first grade, they say, oh yeah, our kids read silently. Well, I think they should be reading aloud. To, uh, they should be reading text aloud in order to get those words bonded, the spellings of the words bonded to pronunciations and memory. And, and then at some point, that's going to become an automatic process so that when they read words silently, they're going to still be pronouncing the words in their head enough so that the spellings map onto the pronunciation. So I'd like to see more research done on um, that early period, especially since silent reading is, uh, as I understand, is pretty commonly used. Uh, yeah, that would be a really interesting and important area to have more clarity on. Um, because it does kind of stand to reason, doesn't it, that activating the pronunciations will support this process of the mapping. Yeah, exactly. To get the because you want to build a, a lexicon of sight words. That's the challenge of beginning readers to get those words into memory. Um, you know, one practice is posting keywords on the wall. Mm -hmm. Well, what good does that do? The words need to get in the kid's head, not on the wall. If he can't read the word, he's not going to recognize it on the wall. You know, right. And, and I think that's that that might be one of those practices that's based on, again, going back, you know, to the idea that somehow, you know, reading is more of a visual as opposed to a, a graphophonemic process. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, I, I consider that kind of a leftover practice, you know, a practice that's left over from old thinking, perhaps. Yeah. So Linnea, you've just had a, you, you've had such a rich career, um, you know, devoted to teaching and reading, and you've made so many contributions. Um, can you leave us with a, you know, a lesson or words of wisdom that you've learned in your many different roles? Um, well, a lesson for, I would say, uh, junior novice beginning researchers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, persistence is uh, especially important when you're trying to become a researcher, you're trying to do uh, studies and publish those studies. Um, and it can be very discouraging uh, when you write up those studies and submit them to journals and have them rejected um, or having to rewrite them uh, in so many ways, <laughs> spending so much time rewriting uh, that you lose confidence in your uh, skills as a researcher, writer, publisher. So uh, just encouraging uh, junior researchers to stick with it and um, work with other researchers. Uh, I think collaboration, sharing ideas with other people is really important. As I was um, uh, moving as I was through my years as a researcher, I got to know other people in the field and we would meet at conferences and we'd talk about ideas and studies. And often those led to uh, doing studies that supported or challenged other ideas. So I think it's important for uh, beginning researchers to embed themselves in a community of researchers. Um, not to just work alone. Um, yeah, and we and we need we need researchers to help. Uh, you know, again, guide and inform our practice. 
So, so supporting them in, in this, per, you know, I, the, the story that you started out with when you submitted to reading research quarterly and, you know, you, you got all those rejections from those editors, but you persisted. That's a, that's a wonderful lesson for people to take, to take to heart. There was, there was one study we did that um, I felt was really central in providing evidence for the connectionist theory. Um, and that was a study showing that when you are teaching new vocabulary words, unfamiliar words, spoken words to children, and you show them the spellings of the words, just incidentally, as they're practicing these pronunciations, and then you test them on their memory for those pronunciations when the spellings are no longer present, that if they saw spellings, they remembered the pronunciations better than if they hadn't seen spellings. Um, and we've done additional studies showing that that really impacts vocabulary learning, that when, when you expose people to spellings, uh, it enhances their memory for the pronunciations. Well, this first study that we did, I was a junior researcher, just uh, trying to get evidence for my theory about connections. Um, and I did one study uh, and then it hit me that I failed to counterbalance. There was a design flaw in that study. So I did a, a second study where I corrected that problem. And then I submitted the paper to a journal and uh, the journal was skeptical. And they said, well, wait a minute, people in the control condition who didn't see spellings, you know, maybe uh, they didn't, pronounce the word as much as the people who saw the spellings, that seeing the spellings made them say the word an additional time. And that's why you saw a better performance when students saw the spelling. So uh, they said I had to do more research before they would accept that paper. So we did a third study where we had multiple conditions. Students pronounced the words uh, extra times in the no spelling condition, or they, uh, they they said the letters in the words or you know anyway other additional control conditions and we still found found that spellings facilitated so that was a third study and then the fourth we added a fourth study where we told children to imagine the spellings not just they didn't see them they imagined what they looked like as they were learning and even that facilitated learning compared to not seeing spellings. Anyway, the point is we did four studies, four studies and finally the editors accepted that paper for publication. So sometimes you have to just replicate, add a condition, you know, persistence again persistence. to figure out how you can get this stuff published. Right. Persistence. And I also like what you said about, you know, collaboration and sharing ideas. I mean, I think so much of, of what your work represents and other groundbreaking work in the field represents big ideas, you know, starting with a big idea and then following that chain of thought to research it and then provide evidence for practice. So that time for sharing and big ideas is really critical. And I should point out that my research has been done with, uh, it's not, I just haven't been operating alone, but I have many collaborators. First of all, when I was at UC Davis um, on the faculty, I had a research assistant, uh, Lee Wills, who was wonderful in helping me uh, carry out my studies. And then when I moved to uh, the CUNY Graduate Center in New York, um, I moved there because it was a strictly, it was a PhD program and um, I would be able to work with students uh, advising them on their dissertations. And um, because I was teaching courses on literacy, uh, I thought that that would get them interested in conducting a study um, that would advance my research program, you know, so that they would join in and, and we would do more studies and that worked out very well. You know, I uh, supervised uh, probably 40 students at the CUNY Graduate student School on their dissertations. Now, not all of them followed, you know, my research program, but many of them did, and it advanced our knowledge about uh, reading processes and instruction. So, 
Wonderful. Well, I, I know I speak for so many of us out there when I just thank you for, for all your contributions and for your persistence. Um, we are we are so appreciative of, of you, Linnea. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Um, so I did want to I did want to close with our rapid fire questions, just because I've done this with all of our other guests. So um, just a few questions, kind of personal questions, I guess. Who was your favorite teacher growing up, and why? Oh, uh, boy, growing up, you mean in like elementary, or even in even in, even, in, even in higher ed? That's fine too. Oh. <laughs> you have a teacher that really sticks out in your memory. Um, well, I guess Dan Slobin, you know, was uh, when he, I took his class in psycholinguistics and, you know, it really opened up the possibility. I was so, became so interested in the study of language behavior, you know, how people process language, how children acquire language. Um, it was just such a, a interesting topic uh, during graduate school and, it's really his course that um, did that. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Dan Slobin. We appreciate that you started Linnea on this, on this course. Um, what, was, what is your favorite book or a favorite book, um, either as a child or as an adult? Well, as an adult, I would say um, uh, it's a book that I listened to. I, when I was at UC Davis, um, I would commute uh, I had to commute about 60 miles between home and campus. And so I would listen to books on tape. And uh, I found this book it, uh, list that was offered. It's called uh, The Winthrop Woman by Anya Seton. And it turns out that that book, uh, it, it's um, historically, it occurs in the 1600s. Uh, it, it was a, a woman who was Governor Winthrop's daughter, and it takes place right where I'm living right now in Stamford. It takes place, you know, in the Massachusetts, uh, mm -hmm. Connecticut area, and it involves interactions between uh, the settlers and Indians. And um, it, it's and the woman Anya Seton. It turns out she's. Uh, Old Greenwich resident. I think she's passed away now. But um, anyway, it became really especially important when I moved to the East Coast and um, mm -hmm. settled in this area. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Well, and I'll, just to let our listeners know, I'll, I'll put some of your recommendations that you've shared and some of these studies in our in our show notes so they can access them. So, um, Linnea, what are you reading right now? Um, well, I'm reading. Uh, uh, Barack Obama's book, The Promised Land. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, during COVID, uh, I acquired a puppy and uh, he's, he's a, a Wheaton Terrier. And <laughs> so he's intruded on my reading time and I haven't been able to read as much as I used to <laughs> before I got this puppy. Yeah, a puppy is very time consuming, isn't it? Indeed, I realize so. Oh my gosh, what, what is your, what's your puppy's name? Quincy, uh, and it's a patriotic name because he was born on the 4th of July. So John Quincy Adams is the, <laughs> the source of Quincy, his name. That's adorable. So he's just a puppy? Is he, he's just? About uh, nine months, eight, nine months. Oh right my now. goodness. Oh, bless your heart. <laughs> what is is there anything you have on your desk that symbolizes you or is dear to you? Um, I would say um, photographs of, you know, I have of my friends and family. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And last question, what are your greatest hopes for today's children? Um, well, let's see. I would, um, I would hope that as many as possible are able to grow up with uh, loving families, with enough to eat, with access to education, and opportunity to become a successful, self-confident adult. Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful. Well said. Well said. A confident adult. So wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for this time today. I'm so appreciative that you would spend this time with me today. And I, I wanted to just close by um, by kind of talking about something that you said in your um, address to SSR in 2004. You quoted Yogi Berra, thank you for making this day necessary. And I just wanted to thank you for making this day necessary for us. And thank you for being here. Um, thank you for your groundbreaking work that has enriched our collective understanding of how we can move closer to our goal of, of helping all of our children to read. So thank you, thank you. Much gratitude. Thank you. I'm really honored. <laughs> and may we all be out in the world soon. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Linnea. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It was such a delight to be able to talk to Linnea Airy today, and I hope you enjoyed this podcast episode. I find her um, a thoughtful and articulate uh, spokesperson around so many ideas and so much research uh, for our understanding of the process of learning to read and reading instructions. So much gratitude to Dr. Linnea Airy. If you enjoyed this episode, if you enjoyed this podcast, please rate us. Also, please provide us with feedback. We, I would love to hear who you'd like to hear from on this podcast. Uh, thank you for your support. Thank you for listening. And I hope to see you again next time. Thanks.